So, to the May 9th, 2018, the trial and board of education meeting is now officially called to order. I'd like to do the roll call. Mm -hmm. Gary here. Mater here. Biscuitchell here. Tronson here. Uh, so we do have a quorum, which is great. So uh, next one is Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, great. So, next thing on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Um, we do have one, you know, minor change to it. Uh, unfortunately, State Representative da David Stephan is not able to attend this meeting, and he's going to be attending hopefully which meeting? The June 13th. June 13th. So right. that that is one change to the agenda. So can I have a motion to adopt the agenda? I'll move to be adopt the agenda with that change. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Pass uh, three zip. Okay. So um, there will be an executive session. So in accordance to Wisconsin Statute 19.85, an executive session will be held at the end of this meeting for consideration of employment, promotion, you know, compensation of performance evaluation data of any public employee over which this body has a jurisdi jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. So there will be a meeting after this. So so you are. Um, are going down to citizens and or uh, delegations is there anyone here that wants to talk about anything outside of the agenda okay. it's a big crowd <laughs> <laughs> so I guess not so okay we're moving on um, moving on to the you know consent agenda um, any questions regarding the minutes or the schedule checks so we should have received all that beforehand not hearing any? Okay. okay. Um, uh, talk about staffing. Uh, there's a new hire, uh, Nicholas Nescovel, to uh, a 1.0 uh, FTE cross categorical instructor position at the high school. New hire of uh, Jacqueline Grant to full time cross categorical you know, instructor position at the district level. Resignation of uh, Michael Michalski. You know, from his full-time school counselor position at Valley View. Uh, retirement requests of Janice Egger from uh, her full-time educational associate. Um, she's been with the district 28 years retirement. So congra congratulations to Janice and, you know, thank you for the, the many years of support and dedication to a So Absolutely. thank you to uh, Janice. Um, we also have a new hire, uh, Lori Hooper, you know, f uh, to a full-time cross-categorial instructor position at Parkview. New hire of uh, Kristen uh, Fugger, you know, to a full-time uh, music you know, choir instructor at the high school. Uh, new hire of uh, Ann uh, Benistol, you know, to a full-time district literacy interventions instructor position. And uh, new hire of Doug check to a full-time associate principal at Valley View Elementary um, so welcome to all those and happy retirement again to uh, you know Janice so and uh, uh, number four looking at the uh, the board's financial reports for March um, Keith you set this out you know prior to the meeting so I, you know uh, hopefully everyone's had a chance to review it um, any questions regarding that Okay. So, having said that, can I get a uh, motion to accept the consent agenda as is? I move to accept the consent agenda. Yeah. Second the motion. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Pass uh, three zip. Okay. Next, we're on to the superintendent's report. All right. right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I was just going to start out by um, saluting and um, saying thank you to our staff. We're, we're celebrating Staff Appreciation Week uh, this month throughout the state of Wisconsin and 
we have, as we all know in this room, a very dedicated staff, be it uh, custodial, food service, bus drivers, people in the classrooms, our administrative group, and they have the ability, I sent a little note out to everyone today, and we're doing different celebrations in the buildings, you know, but I, I put a note out, just, uh, you know, they have that ability to impact and change the lives of students every day, and what an opportunity, and I, I think uh, they never hear thank you enough from all of us, so I just want to salute our staff, and so salute the occupation that, uh, I might have a little bit of a bias, but I think it's the most important occupation in the world, and we, we say that a lot here. So thank you, staff. <coughs> Partners in Education, I'm going to change gears. I serve on a committee with the Chamber of Commerce in Green Bay, and there's a committee called Partners in Education, and we have different subcommittees within that group. I'm on a subcommittee that's really looking at parent engagement, and the goal of that committee is to engage parents. We're trying to get parents involved early on in the child's education. And you may have seen some clips. I'm gonna show just a 30 second clip here in a minute. And it has to do with really trying to get parents to engage. We need you parents is sort of the theme. You're gonna see some of these clips. I wanna to thank um, Fox 11 for taking a full day. They, they videotaped about five different um, segments real similar to the one I'm going to show you and then they're going to be showing well I've seen some of these roll maybe you've even seen this exact uh, clip on channel 11 the whole ob objective is to expose parents to a website where they can learn about career exploration there's a ton of information on that website and then an another objective that the committee is going to continue to work on next year now is really trying to uh, engage parents in the area of soft skills communicating, eye contact, the importance of soft skills as they relate, interpersonal relationship skills, and how, how they relate to the workplace. And so that's a big emphasis that they're gonna continue to work on in the challenge. But I just want to, uh, I wanna thank Partners in Ed, I wanna recognize Fox 11 for doing this. We're also trying to get all of the television networks in, in the greater Green Bay area to join in and show some of these clips. There's another subcommittee besides the, the parent engagement subcommittee. That committee is working on helping educate the greater Green Bay area about school funding, um, equity and funding across the state of Wisconsin. So you'll see clips having to do with that as well. So in, in the tapes that we have, <coughs> Ashwaban volunteered. I want to thank Manny <coughs> Schrader for making a, a lot, of, coordinating a lot of logistics with permission forms. The students involved in the tapes that we have obviously are all from Ash Wabanon. And we made a point to, to use all levels. So elementary, middle, and high school students are represented. Here's just one example, though, of one of those clips. Again, it's just a 30 second <coughs> clip. Every day your child learns important lessons at school. Lessons that develop <coughs> the foundation for future success. But guess what? We need you. We need you. We need you. You can find out so much about how your child is preparing for his or her future by going to parents.org. <coughs> this tool will help you help your child have the best possible success in life. Use it. It's parentsweneedyou.org. We need you. The kids were awesome taping that. We really only had to do a few <coughs> takes because they were so cooperative. So again, a big thanks to uh, Fox 11 to, to your manage for all, the, all the work that you put into that. Um, changing gears another time, the Ashwaubenon Musical uh, Rock School of Rock was nominated for an Outstanding Overall Production Award by a group called um, Center Stage Group. <coughs> and what that means is now they perform, people in, that were involved in this, they perform on Saturday, on May 19th at 7.30 at the Fox Cities PAC in Appleton. I understand this is a pretty big honor because there are musicals all around the state of Wisconsin. There are nominations. And not only was that award given, but we had some other students that were awarded. So we also, a nomination was, was awarded to um, Logan Zills for the outstanding performance of a lead actor. There was another nomination that's represented for John Jeunesse for Outstanding Supporting Actor, and Bria Larson also was nominated for the Outstanding Performance of a Supporting Actress. What they do is they, during this week, they 
they perform for an adjudicative panel of six or seven <laughs> people that are professionals, and now they're also ranked, and I think there's another level of competition. So imagine part of that goes into what happens next Saturday night. So if anyone in the public is interested in seeing those uh, performances, that's May 19th at 7.30, and you do need to purchase a ticket at the, uh, the PAC at Fox Valley. I'm going to change gears again. This has been a busy week. So we had kind of a surprise call and kind of a, a bit of a last minute planning with the visitation of Governor Walker showing up to honor um, the Fab Lab grant. We were awarded a $25,000 <laughs> matching grant for the Fab Lab program. And I just want to thank Mandy Schrader, Brian Nelson, Dirk Ribbons, and Tom Barnhart and the Tech Ed staff. They put together a really neat presentation and what we did is we invited the advisory tech advisory business partners. And we had a room in the Bull Mettler full of people that heard a lot about and had a chance to really see firsthand what we're doing with that whole Bull Mettler Center. And they started the cars up, they demonstrated, the governor was right in there. The kids were awesome. Our kids were explaining what they did and how they did it and, and explaining how the next step was to take the cars now to Elkhart Lake in a couple of weeks. And, very, very powerful. You, you would be very proud to know how the staff and how our kids represent Ashwaubenon on there. And I just want to say thanks to our business partners. A true fab lab can't occur without a, a, a real um, full functioning partnership <coughs> with business partners. So our business partners have been generous from the area of adding all the welding booths with, from the technical college to uh, communications all the way to Australia. And it's a uh, they just keep going. Tomorrow morning, a number of us are going to hear a presentation now from the middle school in terms of where they want to go and how they want to expand that tech ed program. So we, we, uh, they, they have us running and hopping, just trying to keep up with their energy and enthusiasm. So congratulations. And again, especially thank you to Mandy, who pulled a lot of people together in a short amount of time to work with the media and everything that had to work on, on that day to make that happen. Okay, so I'm gonna change gears one more time. I'm gonna go to last Friday morning, and that's the Optimist. Um, it's one of our favorite things to do. And, uh, and Brian Nelson gave a very nice speech. Every year, there's an annual breakfast that honors students that <coughs> serve an, 100 hours or more of, of service. And we had, what, close to 70? There's 70 students and about another 140 parents, so it's a nice, yeah. <coughs> 70 students that have, have volunteered more than a 100 or more hours and we asked them to explain what they did and introduce their parents and, <coughs> and they get recognized by the Optimist Club which is a pretty neat thing. So that's the end of our spectrum in terms of how we celebrate <coughs> at the senior level. I want to highlight Valley View and what we're teaching all, going all the way to the kindergarten area and there's this program, I don't know, Jenny may have heard of it. It's, it's the Valley View Students Spread Kindness in April uh, program. I just want to highlight that again. Is, is that the second year now or is this our third year? It's the second year. So the second year, students completed nearly 3,000 acts of kindness in this fundraising program that was rolled out. Shoveling snow, making goodies for public safety, maybe befriending <laughs> kids that are alone or need, need to be befriended all kinds of different ways of um, acts of kindness. They raised over $10,000, and I, and I just end with a, a positive thanks to the wizard organizer, Jenny Viscatil. So let's give Jenny a round of applause. Put <laughs> you know, I, I'm with that Partners in Ed committee, I shared the press release that Mandy put together about that, because they have a student leadership group in the Greater Green Bay area and they're looking for ideas. She was all excited about that. So I just want you to know, if you get a contact from that organization now, they might want to pick your brain because it's an idea they're going to maybe circulate next year with the group for the student leaders. So okay. thank you, a huge impact. And it's sure a big difference between selling whatever we sell to raise money, to have kids actually pay it forward and to raise money and have staff and parents contribute. And I just want to say thank you to the community whoever participated to in raising that money. So that's my report. Any other questions or comments? All right, I'll change gears up here for Keith. Great, thanks Brian. Moving on to item J.
uh, discussion and presentation items uh, school sa safety assessment Keith Lucius Okay, I'm going to give a quick introduction here and then get out of the way. We have been working on school safety for a long time. It's in the news recently as a big item, but it, that's not when we started. We've been doing this for a long time, training staff, developing plans, and have safety plans. With the recent events, we decided to take it a step further with board discussion about how we should be, what we should be spending our money on buildings and things like that. We decided that while we feel confident we have a very good plan and that we are very secure, we would bring an outside expert to take a look and do an assessment of our facilities and look at where we can improve or where we're best focusing our, our security dollars to make the most improvements and identify any areas of weakness. So McKinstry is a company that has worked in schools for a long time, and I'm not gonna introduce them, I'll let them talk about their history, but we hired McKinstry to come in and do a preliminary assessment, and then one of the things we're gonna ask you about is doing a, a more detailed assessment and having them come back and do a more detailed look. With that said, in March we had McKinstry come in. I'll invite them up. They can introduce themselves and talk about their backgrounds and then they can get into the assessment that we have. Thanks, Keith. Excuse me. This is a safety demonstration. <laughs> 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 Can you uh, go up to the mic, closer to the mic, please? Yeah. So, um, thank you, Keith. Uh, my name is uh, Sean Curry. Um, I'm project development manager with McKinstry. I've been uh, in the construction industry about 25 years. I've uh, been with McKinstry about six years. So, um, I'm here to assist this gentleman here. Um, and as we move forward, I'll be um, leading up the development side of things as, as we, as I say, move forward. So I'll turn over to him. Thanks, John. Uh, hi, my name is Isaac Phones. Uh, I have not been in the construction industry for 25 years. Um, I'm even new at, at McKinstry. My background is in the military. I was in the US military for a little over 10 years doing tactical operations, planning, and missions, and small unit leadership. Um, and when it was time to settle down for my family, I found McKinstry and really fell in love with the values and the vision and how they interact with a lot of different types of communities. So um, that's not, you know, they didn't really bring me on board to start doing security evaluations, but lo and behold, there's a, a pretty high demand for that. Uh, I'm a parent of school age kids and a lot of my family members are in education and so I can immediately see the value and it's easy for me to get uh, invested in this type of information gathering and delivery. So that, that's ultimately why we're, why we're here today to let you know how well you're doing as a district and how well you're taking care of your kids and then a couple things you could do to get even safer. Yeah, so legal disclaimer, the, b the bottom line here, right, is that I, w no one can guarantee outcomes. If anyone tells you they can guarantee outcomes, you should unhire them, all right? The idea is working on your systems and your processes and your people and your training, uh, but at the end of the day, unfortunately, no one has a, a crystal ball, so I have to, the lawyers make me put that in there. Um, you know, I wanna start by highlighting your own mission and your own vision because uh, as the superintendent mentioned, there is no higher calling than preparing the next generation. And so I feel privileged to be a, even a tiny part of what you all are doing in preparing your own next generation um, as I get to contribute to your safety and security planning and, and culture. So I appreciate that. I, I love that you're forward thinking and it's not just this little one line blur, but checking the block. And so thank you for that. Uh, and another really, really big thank you. Uh, I've been to a couple school districts over the last year or so where uh, I, would, I would never allege that they don't care about school safety, but uh, it's just things have been left up to chance. People don't know who has keys in the, in the community. People, they just haven't prioritized it, right? And it's kind of operating on hope. Um, and so thank you, Ash Wadanon, uh, and to your staff and faculty. Uh, you all are doing very, very well. Um, we can tell it's very apparent that you care, that you've taken the time, you've invested the resources to make your school buildings safe and to make and to give your students a secure environment as possible. Um, and so from, as a parent <laughs> to all of you, uh, thank you very much. It actually in some ways made my job harder because I had to find small things uh, because you, you really are doing very well. 
Uh, so I want to back up a little bit, make this slightly educational uh, in the sense that a lot of people have a lot of different opinions about school security, about corporate security, about facility security, security in general. Um, and so I think it's helpful and prudent to let you know uh, what I think are some useful ways that I've learned over the years to think about security. Uh, it's pretty easy to just only consider what's in the news, what's making headlines. It's pretty easy to consider only uh, technological or, or hard infrastructure solutions to your security. Uh, and frankly, it, it's, it's really, really tempting to just kind of get caught off guard by the latest flashy thing and what's, what's the trend. Um, I'll tell you that I was, I was actually, I received an industry email to just a couple hours ago and the headline was, you know, come to this conference and, and here are five layered approach to school security. And so I opened the email and it, and it was all just, <laughs> it was really common sense things. Um, and so there's a lot of people trying to generate interest in, in things that really everyone already knows and you're already doing them. Um, and so these are some things I wanted to highlight. I really want to highlight the idea that it does require everyone to care. It, not that you don't, of course, but staff, faculty, students, parents, coaches, community members, city leaders, everyone has to feel motivated personally to make this their own issue. Uh, and that helps to create a safety culture. And what I mean by a safety culture is not, you know, when you're in the airport and you see this, and there's the signs, the, the see something, say something sign, you know, we. Yes, we want to be vigilant, but no, we don't want paranoia, right? And so there's a balance between everyone having ownership uh, and creating a safety culture and still having a welcoming, friendly, educational, kid-friendly environment. The next thing that I really want to touch on is, is that I can't really tell you what you should do. I can help you talk through your values and what's important to you and then give you some ideas about how there's some safety and security measures that can align with your own values. Uh, but of course, no one wants your schools to look like a prison. And on the other hand, no one wants them to just be a free for all where anyone can walk in at any time. And so it's, it's important to let you know that this is an interactive process, it's collaborative. Uh, as I've mentioned a couple times, it's common sense things that you all are mostly already doing, but it's about your community um, it's not about me or, or my opinions about things. Uh, I just kind of mentioned this. It is a balance. You know, they, we can look at statistics. We can see where, uh, where uh, violent events happen. What grade level of schools are they mostly occurring at around, around the country? And you can make some common sense decisions about those kind of things. But at the end of the day, each school is a little different. The student body is a little different. The staff is a little different. And so uh, that's where the community is involved in balancing kind of hardening <coughs> of your facilities mm -hmm. with the environment, the educational environment that you would like. Um, getting to a little bit more of a, a pragmatic uh, bullet item here is that what I'm going to talk about tonight is based on, as you can see, prevention and reaction. So the prevention gets at all of the things that you are doing, whether it's technology, physical infrastructure, it's training, procedural uh, methods, that's all designed to keep kids safe, to keep everyone who's in your buildings safe. But as I mentioned at the outset, unfortunately, we just can't, no one can guarantee that that's going to happen. In which case, you can kind of think of your reaction, your reactive uh, programming, your reactive methods as things that are, are a backup, unfortunately. Uh, but you, you, know, you have to have them, right? You, can, you, can only, you can't just hope that your prevention works. Uh, and then the very last thing here is, again, that the security measures are meant to deter violence. They're meant to, um, you know, take the, the things that are, that are easy to happen and make them difficult to happen. You want, I mean, I hate to, you know, the, the kid who maybe is, is going down the wrong path with his thoughts, you want them to realize that this could be diff more difficult than I thought. Or the adult in the community who has ill intentions towards students or staff, you want them to realize that uh, yeah, it's a welcoming place, but it, but it's not going to be so easy as me just doing my will in this location. And so, uh, deterring, delaying, and then mitigating the effects via your staff and faculty training, your coordination and partnership with first responders, and and how everyone reacts and coordinates in an unlikely and unfortunate event. You're already doing these things. I don't even want to talk about them. Great staff, great maintenance. The, the facilities are really doing well, and everyone is, is operating at a very high level from my perspective.
Okay, so um, yeah, Keith already mentioned this. We were out here, looked at all six of these buildings. I understand this building uh, may or not may not be moving. So um, we did a quick look through here, but it would be uh, fairly not too useful if I gave you a whole bunch of recommendations for your district office at this point. Um, these are the areas we assess. So the very first slide said it was high level. We were here for one day. Uh, this is not in depth. This is a district wide look. And so we just wanted to look at a system level across the district instead of each facility, all systems. And so we looked at access control, cameras, alarms, communication, and then of course your exterior property and a couple other things that are sprinkled in there. Okay, so uh, again, this is all very common sense. You could kind of think of this as a spectrum of needs no improvement to needs dramatic improvement, right? And everything in between. Uh, I think. What I want you to take away is that, again, th this district is doing very well. The, you're going to see an excellent, you're going to see a couple goods, you'll see a couple fairs. Remember that's district wide, it's not representative of any one particular school. And in those instances where you see a good or a fair, <laughs> remember that my obligation is to, unfortunately, I love highlighting the things that are going well, but my obligation is to highlight the things that, that could use a little bit of improvement. Uh, the, the idea of you know the, the team is only as strong as its weakest member. And so unfortunately there could be one of these, a, a score that you see where the majority of, the, of your buildings are doing great, but there's one school that drags them down or something. So just keep that in mind and please remember you're doing very well. Okay, so uh, we wanted to start in what was easy to identify as your strongest area. Um, first responders, are communicating with you, you're communicating with them, they have your school plans, they have your policies, you're <coughs> conducting exercises and drills, their response time to get to your facilities has been measured. You know, never mind that it's fast, it's been measured, which is fantastic. Uh, people are working together across, you, you know, whatever community, village, city, political divisions to put the kids first, which is phenomenal. You don't see that everywhere. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's the, the policies are very thorough. It's going to be very hard to find things you need to improve in your in your safety and security and your emergency management response plans. Uh, the only thing that I would say needs a little bit of work in in this uh, kind of evaluation area is that you know the first responders are involved and they're participating. Um, and I don't even want to say that they're not good judges of what's going on, but it's always important to have a, a third set of eyes. You know, because if the, if the first responders are evaluating <coughs> how they're operating with you and you're evaluating how you're operating with them, that's fine. And of course, no one is in it for the, the score, so to speak. Uh, but a third set of eyes always helps. So that's what I would highlight about where you could improve with community partnership. But other than that, the best I've seen. Uh, talking about access control. So uh, what I mean, I don't know if everyone's familiar with that term, but this is something, this term refers to everything from do you have doors to do they lock and what kind of keys do you have for them? How do people who are supposed to opening them, open them opening them? And how are people who are not supposed to be opening them prevented from opening them? So again, it's, it's very common sense, but a lot of times things that just kind of get lost in the shuffle. So we think about the card readers that you have virtually district wide. We think about the fact that you've gone to a single entry main entrance for all of your facilities across the district, which is fantastic. That's the way of the future and you're already there. Um, your key accountability is already very good. Um, and then the, and the card readers are, are in use, which is fantastic. <laughs> a couple things that you can note is that um, your staff were very open and honest with us when we were talking to them and interviewing and taking a look around and yeah there's there's kids that, that prop doors open sometimes you know when maybe it's for environment maybe it's just for ease of coming in and out to a to a fiat class or whatever the case may be but the reality is we're trying to create a mesh an overlapping system of of measures that enable you to to rest assured that the people who are supposed to be in are in and the people who are supposed to be out are out um, because you're ahead of the curve your card readers may or may not be able to um, sync up with other systems, with your security camera systems, with your alarm systems. You have a couple, at least a couple different generations of card readers. Mm -hmm. So they're all functioning, you know. So again, very good, but there's, there's room to, to just inch it up a little bit and, and get into that excellent category. Um, and then the procedural control, again, this is a thing where we're talking with staff, 
um, and looking at your policies and seeing how how do we deal with making sure that which doors are closed and locked or accessible at which times of the day is that communicated broadly across the district so I mean I really am splitting hairs with here with you here because because it's so excellent but that you know we, we can't take security too seriously right so that's access control good I would say very good um, I, I would you know if there's one place that's kind of dragging it down I think uh, I'm sorry to name names but Keith twisted my arm uh, you know core mirror really has no effective access control to speak of I mean the doors locked and that kind of thing but the vestibule is is open we could use some procedural improvement there uh, again pre-k kindergarten early learning not your typical target but um, that's not really the point right and so that's that's probably why the district is a good instead of an excellent so let me just comment on that it's not about the people at Cormier. Oh. <laughs> I just want to be clear on that. They are doing an awesome job. It is the, the way the building's set up and what we, what we talked about possible solutions a little bit and where adding an entryway vestibule and, and moving the office so to right there. So really what you want is everybody to go through the office to get in the building. In Cormier, if you get buzzed in and someone gets buzzed in and just wants to do something they're not supposed to they just go and there's no way the people in the office could stop them because of the location so mm -hmm. it is purely a building setup issue not people and I just want to be clear because people issues aren't there and one other story I want to highlight is what one of the people who came out <coughs> would try to get in past the, the people at the entry door and we had two stories that were great to hear he got into the building and at Parkview, one of the lunch du new duty people saw him standing there and went and found the police liaison officer and said, there's a strange person in here who just seems to be standing looking around and got the police liaison. That's exactly what we want to happen. And then at Cormier, we had the same thing happen where one of the new duty people saw him in and went and told, I think, Maria Arena that, we, hey, we have somebody in the building. I don't know why he's here. And that's what we want people to do. So I think that was a great story to show the, the people controls and the awareness are working well yeah thank you Keith and, and I, I nothing that I'm gonna say should be applied to, to people to your staff and your <laughs> faculty everyone was very vigilant everyone was very aware of what was going on people are communicating well so yeah thank you for the clarification Keith. okay so uh, surveillance is a funny word and it gets in the news a lot and people want their privacy uh, but we're, what we're really talking about is is part of your overall security and safety plan that meshes well with your access control and your awareness that's the idea that's what we're wanting to get to so this again is a very very strong good for the whole district you've got cameras in place <coughs> and they're by and large covering the right areas we're talking about tiny things like are your is your resolution good is your frames per second capture good enough to be helpful if you're doing an investigation or trying to look at someone in your school building your server capacity is it there do you want it on the cloud do you not want it on the cloud so very very small things um, I think that there are some places that aren't um, covered but again this really is going to go back to the philosophy that you have as a district is do you want every square inch of your school surveilled and recorded or not and so that's not something that you know I put it up there because it, you know I, I need to bring it up but it's the, the answer isn't necessarily more cameras you know I think there are some spots where we can look at putting them but I'd, please don't hear me communicating that your school is not covered and, and you can't see the right places um, I think you've got some cameras that are aging of course uh, I already kind of touched on you know being able to improve that I was working with the school district a few weeks ago where they had a, a break-in in a car in their parking lot and they had to use the cameras from the public building next door that happened to be looking into their parking lot because they they couldn't even see what happened even though their their cameras were on the parking lot so you just want to be careful again that <coughs> technology solution wise you spent the right money for the right solutions in the, in the right places um, I already talked about servers a little bit uh, are, is it tied up is it back is it tied in is it backed up does it hold the amount of data that you want it to hold again your solution is not mine but I, I want to bring up the different ideas Isaac yeah. sir if you don't mind interjecting for questions here but uh, uh, in your analysis you know are, do we have the cameras in the, the right places today you know looking at doors and mm -hmm. hallways and yeah the cameras that you do have are looking in the right places I think one of my recommendations is going to be that uh, we have a conversation about do you want 100% of your entrances and exits covered uh, do you want 100% of your hallways covered do you want your stairwells covered so you shouldn't be worried about any of the cameras that you currently have in terms of what they're looking at 
but I would recommend <laughs> making sure that we go through I mean and it's it's a matter of your plans having your plans for your buildings and no kidding every single door in your building across the whole district and standing out there physically and saying do we need a camera here do we not need a camera here if we're gonna put one here where is it looking um, so there are some that can be added uh, but the ones that you have are in good shape did you also take a look at how long we're maintaining this data for uh, I don't know if we asked time. that okay. um, do you remember off the top of your head yes it depends on how much the uh, cameras get used because they're on electric eyes. Yeah. So for instance, there's less footage being taken at night during the day, but generally it's, it's upwards of a month that we keep data. Are our cameras activity based where yeah. they kind of just turn on or are they on 24 by seven? Activity based. Well, you know, just as someone walks up by, does the, the camera, you know, activate yep. then? Yep. Okay. Yep. So we're not streaming data all day. No. no, 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 and that's that gets back to that server capacity comment is, you know, it's not, you know, this isn't a, it's not a Fortune 100 company where <laughs> you need to have every second of every day recorded. I think the motion triggered recording that you do have is good. Again, it's a matter of aligning the technology w with where you want it to be and what you want it to be doing for you. I agree with your comment as far as the uh, resolution goes. Yeah, some of the cameras you take a look at the data and it's kind of like you, you see a green blob sure and you know it's a person but you don't see anything else so the resolution of the cameras would be very important in this case for us right and one of the recommendations and again everything is still very high level at this point but one of the recommendations you'll see at the end is having the ability to um, and the fortunate the good news is that there's a lot of technology companies out there now that allow you to tie in your cameras mm -hmm. to specific card readers such that uh, you can get a notification or the superintendent or the principal can get an email or text notification if uh, somebody bypasses a card reader and uses a key or if someone uh, op uses their card to attempt to open a door at a time when they shouldn't be and that kind of thing and that's all tailored to your sensitivity as a district and what sort of information you want to trigger <laughs> your notifications but the good news is there's a lot of helpful solutions out there that can again just kind of tighten the system up a tiny bit Oh, I want, yeah, alarm systems next. So um, again, you have alarm systems, you have panic buttons, the staff is aware of where everything's at. Um, it sounds like the custodial staff and the other staff in the buildings are aware of the, the processes, you know, who should they be contacting, who should be contacting them, who's notified in the event that an alarm is tripped, is it based on time, is it based on activity? So the good news is they're there, and by and large, people are aware of what's supposed to be happening with the alarm systems. I think. Um, we, you know, we've got a couple different systems in a couple different locations. I think that's anytime you you start doing that, it just quite frankly presents a, a small vulnerability, and that's why you really want to have one up to date integrated system for all of your buildings. It helps for y reducing number of user interfaces. It helps for reducing the different systems that people have to be trained on. Do you have dis different expectations for different systems at different locations? And the the more of those questions that you can eliminate, the easier it is for everyone to be trained and proficient on what your own processes are. So that's really kind of the big takeaway from alarm systems is, is uh, you've got them, there's a little bit of room for improvement and I think an important thing, so don't, don't hear me say that you're not doing this, but the important thing moving forward is continuing to ensure that the, the, the procedures and the communication about the procedures uh, is top of mind while we're implementing whatever alarm system you, you do or do not change going forward. Any questions about that? Great. So communication system is, is much the same um, in terms of things that I would recommend for improvement as the alarm system. Um, obviously, the, the, there's no reported problems with teachers in classrooms. Um, I understand that uh, the right people have radios at the right times. There is the ability to get a hold of people on their cell phones if you need to. Um, again, I'm really, I'm really <coughs> splitting hairs here, but, but we're gonna, I'm going to continue to beat this drum of make sure that everyone has the, the right capabilities and is trained and aware of who's supposed to be talking to who and how and when. And I'm not saying that you're not doing that, but new st you know, people are retiring, people are coming on, people are busy, people are inside, people are outside, people are on vacation. Um, and so you, you can't stress communication enough. 
really. Um, and so when I say lack of redundancy, that's not district wide. It's not like uh, you're in really bad shape. It just means that there are some small gaps where we could clean up who has radios, who has phones, and how should people be expecting to communicate with one another, especially in the event of an emergency or of a crisis, um, and making sure there's no question marks there so that people have the, the information that they need when they need it. Uh, a couple opportunities, updates in intercom systems, um, and potentially even tie that into alarms, uh, fire and life safety systems, and maybe even cameras. And I just, so, um, before you continue on here, but you know, how is our communication to the emergency responders? Yeah, so the good news is that uh, the alarm company is, I'm going to, I'll get right to your question here in a moment, but the alarm company uh, and uh, Tom have good communications. Your staff has good communications with the alarm company. So what's expected there and who's calling who under what circumstances is, is very good. That's solid. Um, the, the question about how are we communicating with first responders and how are first responders communicating with us in the district, again, that's covered in your emergency management plan, uh, but I'll go back to my previous comment that we have to make sure that, that it, it is, it's doing what you want it to do, uh, that everyone knows what to expect from it and that the uh, solutions are in place to make sure that communication happens. So the direct answer to your question is good. Everything's fine with communicating with first responders. Um, I think it, there's some small areas where we can make it better. Thank you. Okay, so don't uh, be too upset because uh, when you start talking about exterior property, this is one of the lower, you know, I mean, it, it's if your shrubs are blocking the driveway and the ability to see out there, I mean, the reality is it's a, it's a school, it's not a police compound, it's not a prison, it's not a military outpost, you know, so don't get too concerned about the fair. Uh, we did look around every single building in the district and 95% of the time, there's not anywhere for, for anyone to be crouching and hiding by shrubs or bushes next to a building. I mean, the, the kinds of lines of sight obstacles that you would have are things like the, you know, the big sign where there's a five degree window where you couldn't see what was on the other side of it, you know, but that's obviously not a, not a very big deal. I think the reason we went fair here um, is because you start looking at the elementary school and sharing space with a public park and not having a physical barrier there. Um, some blind spots, uh, you know, from one side of a parking lot to another or around a corner, or, or really if I was going to highlight one thing, it would be the, the school buildings where the front entrance, the front office staff can't really see who's coming and going. Um, and again, it's, it's tempting to kind of worst case it and, and they need to see if, if the wrong person is coming in, but the, but the reality is they really need to be knowing who's coming and going anyway and being prepared to receive visitors and who's there to pick up their kids and who should be leaving right now. Um, so again, the signs are good, windows and doors are marked appropriately and clearly, um, and by and large you can see where you need to see, uh, but there's some small areas that we can clean up. So talking about windows, um, there's, so <laughs> this one might be a legitimate fair. Um, there are some places where you'd have a hard time getting a lot of kids out of, out of classroom windows in a hurry if you needed to. Um, you definitely want to highlight this idea uh, that there, there is no bullet or shatterproof glass in the district to speak of, and certainly not in the areas where we would recommend you have it. Um, and then uh, there are some, there's still some legacy single pane uh, glazed units around the district that are uh, it's loosely related to safety and security but you're you're probably leaking heat out of them and that's just something to keep in mind and and those kind of climate issues you don't think of as related to security but those are the kind of things that get people propping doors and leaving windows open and that kind of thing so it, it all ties in um, again you do have a lot that are upgraded um, and I was I was trying to find a window or a door that wasn't marked and I just couldn't find them. You've got them all marked for first responders, which is fantastic. Um, and so I wanna, it might be hard for some of you to see, but uh, the, uh, the emergency egress method here in this classroom is this rock that was set by the window, you know, break in case of emergency. Uh, so that's probably, I assume, not with what the district wants to have going forward. But uh, again, that was only in one room, so. Um, I, I think there's some room for improvement here, but again, it's not like it's not like the windows are missing or unlockable or anything. There, we checked for that. So, any questions about windows? Okay, 
So uh, here's the good stuff we'll just talk a little bit about. And again, these are general, these are district wide. Um, and these are, as I said at the very beginning, meant to be topics of discussion among community stakeholders. Uh, with McKinstry, uh, with your first responders. This really needs to be an, a, a, a group effort and coming up with what's the right way forward for Ash Um So, for example, um, you know, there isn't a huge problem with doors being propped open, but uh, we don't have door prop alarms or we don't have alarms that can tell you when doors are being propped. They're not tied into your other alarm system. And there's really, there's really great solutions out there that are pretty efficient um, to scale across a district or across a school building where it's just a matter of setting again what's your community's tolerance how long are you willing to let a door be propped open who do you want notified when that inappropriate amount of time elapses that kind of thing um, I think uh, we talked about cameras already uh, I've mentioned this idea of integrating your systems uh, a few times so I won't belabor that when I say envelope hardening, that's kind of tied in with this climate and environmental control and that's the idea of there's two main ideas with with these you know, uh, are there infrastructure or, or when I say envelope, you know, windows, doors, roof, walls, these kind of things, are there st structural issues that could present a vulnerability if, if, if there's kind of left to go for some amount of time? Uh, largely in your district, the answer is no, but it's certainly something that begs further evaluation. Um, and then this idea with the climate environmental control is in addition to indoor air quality um, and just comfort for, the, for a great learning environment. Again, when, when students and staff are, are, are uncomfortable, that's when doors are propped, that's when doors are left open, and people are, aren't thinking, right, they're not thinking about safety and security and, and policy, you're thinking about how do I cool down, you know, and so that just overrides everything else. So if we can take care of those things with your, with your HVAC systems or other energy efficiency systems, then it's not detracting from your overall safety and security system. Um, Talking about visitor management system, you do have one. I think there's some recommendations there about getting it automated and just kind of eliminating a little bit of the room for error with visitor management. Uh, vehicle traffic flow improvements, that's uh, definitely more safety than security side of the house. Uh, but we wanna make sure, again, the right people are in the right places at the right times, that it's being managed, that it's being watched, and that you know the, the, the lanes of traffic, the lanes of travel, that it's all foolproof, and it just, it's pretty easy to passively ensure that people who are driving, whether it's buses or, or students or family members, are in the right places at the right times. And that's fairly easy to accomplish with, with some other improvements about your parking lot infrastructure and, and flows. Uh, and so then the very last thing I'll mention really is this increasing security of main entrances. So sure, we talked about Cormier, um, how there's not really any good infrastructural um, dynamics right there that would, that would kind of prevent people from going places they don't need to go. Um, the, you know, the talk about having a vestibule there, talk about where does the district want to have bulletproof glass? Is it around the main office so that the people who are needing to call first responders and the people who are needing to press your panic button have the time to do that? Again, I, I really don't like talking about this part of it, but you know, you're, you're talking about buying seconds, you know, probably not buying minutes. And so in those kind of cases, what aligns with your policy, what you want to see happen, and what is the physical solution that is gonna help you get there to save lives in a worst case scenario. Um, and so that's what I mean when I'm talking about increasing security of main entrances and I've, I've highlighted glass. Any questions about any of these higher level recommendations? Great. So uh, as Keith mentioned at the beginning, um, I would love to to be able to, to come back and, and dive deeper. I would love to be able to get everything to an excellent, which as I hope I've communicated by now is not a big step. Um, and what we would what that could look like is uh, expanding how we're looking at access control systems. This is where, you know, it's the painstaking walking around and looking at every single card reader and every single window and every single, you know, and just gathering all the right data so that we can make comprehensive recommendations to you and work with you uh, about how you can meet your own safety and security goals. Um, additional evaluation areas would be um, adding, taking a look at, you know, we, we talk to your staff about what your emergency management plan looks like, um, but we would really be combing through that and finding out from you if it's meeting your needs. Are the things that are in there, are they even lined up with what your local public safety, with what they're training on? I think they are. There's a really good chance in this case that they are. But 
we don't want to assume, right? So looking at policies, um, looking at uh, your emergency, your emergency planning, and that gets into everything from your staff training and education to your different drills, if you will, for what happens under different circumstances with with fire and police department. So again, we're just growing the areas that we've already given a high level look at, and then adding some areas that would give you a complete picture. So uh, where we're at right now today, obviously, is uh, hopefully this was a helpful just kind of overview of. Uh, what we saw and and uh, things that we recorded and I think we took uh, 1,600 pictures in, in one day. Uh, it was it was it was a lot even for a high level. Um, and uh, I hope that the information has been helpful. I'd love to answer some questions if you want to have a further discussion uh, about this. I'm more than happy to participate in that. Uh, but the bottom line is, as I said, uh, that your vision, your mission, and your vision are phenomenal. We are investing in the next generation. My kids are the next generation, and, and it's, a, it's an honor to be able to just speak to you about how well you're doing with your own safety and security. So unless there's any other questions, or Sean, anything you wanted to add? Great. I'm assuming as part of your assessment, you would uh, prioritize as well. What would be the bigger benefit? Of course. Because obviously, we can't do everything day one. Sure. So one of the things, Paul, that I put the King Street in a tough spot for circumstances that the state grants came out and we needed to get something on the grants soon. So I asked them for the, the recommendations, even though they didn't do the detailed one, their high level recommendations to help us with what we would put in the state grant. But what to, to prioritize in talking with, with the Kim Street, we want to do that detailed security of that, and then we can do a better job of prioritizing. But there are certain things with the state grant, like the bulletproof shatter, bullet resistant, shatter resistant glass, that's right, written right in that grant, and we need to get something submitted fairly soon. So I pushed them to give us the list of, of ideas so we could work on that grant and have that. But I really recommend we do the detailed security evaluation, and then we would get it prioritized, and it would be each building would have so much time spent that we'd be able to identify and put together a plan for what our highest needs are and then McKinstry's resources can help us also look at what the costs of certain in improvements would be and we can do that detailed and come back with a plan right. and it may not have dates on it but if we have this much money we work, work as far down the plan as we can this year next year if we can uh, allocate money we work, keep working down the plan if the state grants continue out year after year we can use that money otherwise we can figure out how to work it in our budget kind of restructure our five-year or ten-year building and maintenance plan for those things and and look at our training budget and some of those other things as well so that's that's why you didn't see a prioritized list here they were they were I really had to push them to give us the list that they gave us because well, they didn't spend the detailed time to do the prioritize. Yeah, and I agree with you. I wasn't expecting a, prior a prioritized list now, but as far as your future analysis, I would hope that would be part of it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And when, when does that grant uh, request? June 8th, is that the deadline? Right? Right? Last day of school, June 8th. June 8th yeah. is when it has to be right. into the state. So. All right. Um, at the end, you give a report, so uh, September 1st. Now, do you walk help walk us through that then? I mean, is there is that this report? Here you go, or what kind of steps? Yeah, um, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning uh, about one of the things that I liked about joining McKinstry, and it's the partnership aspect. Um, there's not we realize that there's very limited helpfulness to you if we just plop a report on your desk and say good luck. So yeah, yeah the idea is the is follow through and partnership and the ability to help you continue to adjust as necessary, make the right decisions for the time and resources you have available. And I think it's important to realize this is a dynamic issue. I mean, no two school violence events have been the same. So something different seems to happen in each one. So having a plan that's perfect today and tomorrow isn't perfect because something different is happening. So I, I envision it as, as he said, a partnership where it's not a one-time event. We get that report so we can start putting a plan together, but we're going to have to review it on a regular basis, review what's happening in the world other where other issues have happened. So we are we're dynamic in, in adjusting to what's happening around us and what where the different things are and taking into account new research and new findings. So I, don't, I also don't want to mislead you into thinking this is a one-time event and then we do it and then everybody's happy and we move on. No, security is going to be an ongoing issue and I see McKinstry as a partner to give us the outside resources and research and connections to help us stay as a very secure, very safe place for our students. 
So and I understand that some of the urgency, well, comes from our concerns, obviously, too, that we brought up, but because of the state grant that is the monies that are being offered, um, in that, is there anything in there, was it clear, I thought there was some leniency towards um, also resources of people in addition to structure, or did it end up being just the state structure? The does not structure. cover people at all. It doesn't, okay. No. So and there are other things we can do people-wise, and we are talking with the village about things people-wise. Okay. So we're not leaving that in. And I think the biggest thing that we didn't talk about here, because it's not McCaffrey's role, is that on that prevention side as far as student services, and I think we need to that have those discussions as well. Okay. Great. So Keith, is there anything that you need from the board? Uh, tonight don't, or we don't need action on this this is we'll informational we're going to work on the grants and, and try to secure our share of those grants so we can start ticking those things off on, on that we can get approved by the grant right now we're going to be reviewing our 10-year building plan and try to integrate some of these things and I guess the just doing board feedback and do you support us moving forward in doing the detailed security evaluation and knowing we're going to put some money towards that rather than putting it towards jumping right into some of these changes We've got to put some money aside for the cost of the doing the evaluation because it is a lot of time on their part. It is a very hands-on process to walk every building and spend a full day with multiple people. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that the board's supportive of that going that direction. Well, so how much is the their contract to get to the final report? We haven't negotiated a final fee yet, so I, I don't know. I, I was pushing to get this so we could do the grants, and that's one of the things that we are going to be talking about. So. I, I'll negotiate a contract that I think we're getting more than our money's worth and I, McKinstry's been a great partner to the school districts in the state for a long time. They're, they're going to be reasonable and we'll come up with a fair assessment based on the amount of time we we're requesting from them. But I can't give you that amount unless Isaac, you had discussions and you guys are able to come with that. Well, no, I hate to give a non-answer, but it, but again, as I said at the beginning, what do you want? How much time do you want? How much depth and, and breadth would you like? And, and so it would be less than helpful to throw a number out there right now without having those discussions with with what your priorities are. That's fair. The scope needs to be defined for you to give us a number. Yeah. Right. I guess that's fair. Right. Yeah. I guess in in you know, you know, safety and security is paramount, right? So you know, I'm speaking for myself. So I'm more in favor. Are you moving forward with this? Okay. I also don't think you can, it would be, I think, foolish to spend money without knowing what the priorities are and what the specific, I mean, because there may be things that we say, like you said, it's a partnership, so as a community we say, well, they're saying we could do this, but we feel like we don't need to do that right now. We want to do this. You know, I mean, I think, that, and we don't know what those exact recommendations are. So how can you make an informed decision if you don't have all the information? I think there are some things that we know we can do, and, and I think Isaac laid those out, and, and, and we've talked administratively about things in the buildings that we feel we know we can do, security cameras and you know, improving some of those things. Mm -hmm. So we're going to move forward with some of those with that grant money as soon as we get it secured and then let this process lay out to what are our next steps and having a, a longer range plan and I hate to feel like we're just putting band-aids on things. I want to have a plan and know where we're going and, and have cost estimates and say, okay, each year we're, we're plans are to do this, but then each year reviewing that before we just go ahead in case the world has changed in a different way and we have to protect against some other threat or other issue. So I guess I'm, <coughs> would be more on a minimalistic of this going forward. Um, I think there's a lot of other things that need money more than a very detailed analysis going forward. I got what I wanted out of this, that we have, uh, um, that we're doing bellowing things, that we have an idea of what we need to improve on. I guess I'm not going to object to going forward in a detail, but I would say in the negotiations, I would be on the low end of what really needs to go into. I mean, I see things like door propping, you know, where, yes, I'm sure he thinks like, you know, that's the need the verification, but I mean, I'm at events where, you know, it's, it's evening and the doors actually, not that they have been, but I'm imagining when it could be, it's, you know, to me, that's not a, <coughs> so um, to, to, to look at something in depth when I, I don't think it needs to be looked at in depth, um, I would just caution on going into too much detail on things that don't need to be detailed. Um, and again, you know, to 
depending on what comes out of that grant money, you know, uh, you know, does if you apply for something, does it have to be used for specifically what you apply for? Yes. yes. In this so case, it does, and there, I, right now, the the way a state is talking to us, it's roughly around twenty thousand dollars a building, and there's a pretty specific list of items that will pertain, and they're even coaching us if you put more in there than than that amount or the wrong items you'll probably be put to the bottom of the pile and they are trying to make this accessible to all public schools but also private schools in the state so it is pretty specific so then again i would caution that uh you know whatever we can do to get that grant as best as possible but then after that grant period what's in there to have this whole detailed look at stuff that's not in the grant um I would uh, think that we have the money better spent in other places. I, but I think we just need to look at what is there. So I'll go back to the discussion we had about Cormier and the entrance. I think that's an issue for several things, not just the security issue that we're talking about here. And that may be something we want to prioritize in the 10 year building plan and put that as a project out there. One of the things they talked about was the bus traffic. And that's something we've talked about as the board for seven or 10 years at, at Cormier and how do we separate the foot traffic from the parent drop-off traffic from the bus traffic and that was something that they noticed right away and, and that while it falls into something that they're looking at it's something that we've been looking at for years and they can help us design that and, and, and so I agree with you Michelle I don't think we want to put a huge dollar amount into doing the research when we have a good list of projects to go on but I think having that outside set of eyes look and say here's where your priority should be while, but I, I respect that let's not over spend on research, let's spend on making the safety improvements so we can do that and, and that's one of the things McKinsey can help us with the projects as well. And let's evaluate the state's improvements versus the other needs of uh, you know, prevention rather than... Mm -hmm. Right, than oh, exactly, yes. Yeah, I'm going to say too, it's, uh, we don't want to be guessing at what we want to do first or what that priority is, so I think that's where this may help. Do you have schools that have done the detailed that you know maybe that we could talk to and, and to see what the result was? Or? Yeah. So right now, um, as I mentioned earlier, McKinstry didn't hire me to do security evaluations. It's just that yeah. the demand has risen, and so what it's looked like in the past, frankly, has been people. I, I do facility consulting for public sector buildings, um, and sometimes. They want a, a, just a little bit of sprinkling of security. You know, how's our alarms looking? And how's our fire and life safety? And then sometimes they want a little more. So the direct answer to your question is, is there a, a detailed uh, security evaluation previous client who we've given this full-blown report to? No, because I do facility consulting and, and, and sustainable capital renewal planning for McKinstry. Uh, this is quite frankly a fairly, uh, I, I don't want to say I'm new to it. I want to say this would be a new type of report. Does that make sense? Field where there's I struggled to find somebody who could come in with a fresh set of eyes and look at this. It was I went to the Wisconsin School Safety Coordinators Association and talked to the president of the organization and talked to people who were active in there and tried to find who was the best to do it. And McKinstry's background with building and all those functional systems and then the people they have recently brought on or in the last five years brought on have superintendent experience, you've got some of the Isaacs, you've got military experience, you've got all those different areas. So I don't know that anybody's done this type of detailed security analysis, that, that, but it's something that everybody's talking about, how do we get that? And, and if I may, I, I've been involved in several schools that have looked at pieces and parts of it. One bulletproof glass uh, after an incident, uh, the Sandy Hook incident um, several years ago. Um, that uh, a superintendent in one of the school districts um, um, down to the down towards Madison looked at both roof glass. So we did look into that, check into that, and there's been other uh, school districts uh, even further south towards Milwaukee that we've looked at cameras, intercom systems, uh, communications, and, and so forth, and and um, card access. And we've done quite a few installations. Uh, for upgrading their security um, systems. To detail to each each piece, um, this would be, you know, like you said, this is one of the first reports that we've been put together. But I want to be clear, they have the resources that others don't. So I want you to think they just went into this business because it's, you know, they have the people who are trained 
and they have been involved in this for a long time from different aspects, and now they're just kind of bringing it together into one comprehensive plan. Okay. And I think also, like, I feel like this is one piece of what we're discussing right. in terms of increasing safety, so this is one piece of it. We also are talking about people and resources and mm -hmm. the relationship that we need to have with the students. So, um, but I think that that's, an, uh, I thought that was an understanding that this is one piece of it that would cost some money. Luckily, we're getting grants to pay, hopefully, for parts of that, for a good chunk of that. Um, but that's not to deter from the other pieces that we're looking Correct. at, right? Correct. So. Yeah, I would argue that prevention is probably the most important part. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I get sure. that here? Sure. Um, we do, in addition to the grant that um, Kurt is really diligent about writing right now, which is fantastic. We do have a mental health Pretty plan. sure I heard he say we. <laughs> okay, all right, so it, it's, a, it's a joint collaboration. So we're all giving input. Um, I am also working on the mental health grant, which is due on the 31st of May, which hopefully can help increase some level of service at all. You know, it's not going to be huge because the grant is very small and it is competitive. So. A lot of people are trying to get the grant, so mm -hmm. they give money to the best written grant and where they see the most needs. So we are certainly looking at that. Just okay. to let you know that, in addition to this part, we are looking at that as well. Great. Okay. Any more discussion? Very good. Great. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to Teal's volunteer. Uh, Jamie Everbeck and Craig Horska. Hi, Scott. Hi, Scott. Alrighty, so this will be hopefully pretty brief. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys about an opportunity, a partnership opportunity that we're taking advantage of with Microsoft. And I brought Craig along with that. I'll, I'll have him here to uh, be available for questions as well. But basically, some of you were here. Um, years ago <laughs> we made the switch from kind of an old-school math elective computer science program to a more comprehensive kind of vocational path the way with computer science and um, it's it, that's our comprehensive computer science curriculum at the high school and, and Microsoft about maybe two months after we made that decision introduced project teals which at that point was also its own curriculum now Microsoft has kind of evolved to offer this outreach program where Basically, they go out into the community and look for volunteers who then can come in and provide Craig with kind of real-world experience in computer science. Um, it used to have a high-end cost because it was curriculum, and now it's basically free. Um, the only piece for us would have to cover background costs, background check costs, and um, potential travel reimbursements for volunteers. So um, what that looks like is we would be basically advertising for volunteers. We would only need one, maybe two, um, to assist Craig with computer science, where they would be available for Craig to talk about real world examples. They might physically come into the classroom. They might just be an outside resource for him to contact, um, which is just kind of a neat community buy-in with our computer science program. Also, by being in this, Microsoft will invo invite all the schools that are part of this program to their determined computer science fair, which ultimately will be hosted at the Microsoft Incubator, which will be in Town right here. So that's a pretty neat thing. Um, so I just want to show you, this is, I didn't share this with you, but this basically there's three models. There's the co-teaching model, which is you use all Microsoft's um, curriculum and they actually co-teach the teacher. Something that we're not aware of because we have Craig is that a lot of school districts really struggle to find quality computer science teachers. We are very blessed, Craig, how many years? Uh, this is my 22nd year. 22nd year. We're very blessed to not only have someone in that role, but someone who has really modeled what kind of career learning looks like. Craig has continually gone to training to keep himself on the forward end of computer science, which is a difficult field to stay ahead in. And um, he's embraced the change of moving from, like I said originally, it was basically almost like a math elective program to now something that's a vocational college and career readiness piece. And it's, uh, like I said, a lot of schools struggle with it where they were leaning on Microsoft actually to find people to kind of co teach their teachers we are lucky enough that we don't need that. We have someone that's very skilled at this. So we're all the way on the other end of this, which is the classroom enrichment piece, where they find volunteers that basically are just looking to provide um, real world kind of enrichment opportunity. So with that, um, part of our obligation is that we kind of have to advertise the volunteer part. So um, we're kind of meeting that obligation a little bit tonight. Um, and then we're going to lean on Mandy Schrader to use um, Facebook and social media to look as well. Um, we are not only district in the area of Alaska, 
De Pere and all the Green Bay Public Schools are going with Teals this year in some form as well. Um, Appleton also has a pretty large base. So um, if you have any programming questions, that's why this guy's here. Um, any other questions about the program itself? I know maybe some of you might be interested in participating, maybe. I don't know. Not right now. Well, at least know someone in so. so this is just mostly a, kind of a, an FYI kind of piece, but. Okay. It's just an exciting opportunity with what's coming to Lambeau Field or Titletown District. Sure. Kind of a, a no-brainer for us to take advantage of. Yeah. We are. Craig, maybe you want to take a second. Right? Craig is also an AP writer. He can maybe talk about what that AP project looks like. It's very different than the typical AP test. <laughs> there's a there's a new AP class that came out uh, two year or last year was its first year, and I went down to Kansas City in last summer and read for the AP Computer Science Principles class. And the way that they AP has designed this class is they've designed it as an everyman class, where it's not, like most AP classes are your capstone, where you're gonna take AP Calculus, or you're gonna take uh, AP Physics, where you, it's the end result. They envision this as that everybody in every career is gonna have to have some semblance of understanding of what computer science is. And so that's what this designed around is this computer science principles is designed around this is something that everybody has to know so everybody that is going to go into these careers should know this stuff and so it's kind of an every person class and rather than a capstone class and uh, being project lead the way uh, the way that they have set up the curriculum has been great especially once you go and read the what they're supposed to do uh, and how they're going to be evaluated for it uh, it really T uh, tailors itself to that which has been great for me because going into this when you kind of go into it blind where it's this is the first thing it's going to be the test is not even made yet those kind of things or how they're going to evaluate the kids and you're just saying well this is what I think it's going to be now we have a, a knowledge of knowing it and I'm going back to Kansas City again this year again the, the um, being able to have that opportunity is fantastic because uh, you get to sit down with like the Dean of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon was sitting next to me at a meeting. I mean, the people that you get to, to be with are great that way. And then that's what this class is all about. And so then how can we grow that and get kids then the next part, which is real world experience. Like there's one thing to be in the classroom and it's another thing to be able to talk with somebody that's actually doing this in their career. You know, and again, I, my career has been in education, you know, so I understand how to teach it but what they're doing outside of it and how you would use it in your career, this, this Teals model would be great to be able to bring in somebody and then have them as a resource for the kids to say, hey, this is where I want to go or this is what I want to do or is, am I going to have an, is there an intern possibilities that I can look at or you know, job shadowing things and that kind of stuff where they can look at that kind of stuff that way, so. What's the name of that class? Uh, it's AP Computer Science Principles. It's a brand new class that, that AP is generated for this specifically. Is there a certain background in the individual that you're looking to volunteer? Uh, just a computer science background would be okay. for, you know, or what that, that they're using it, you know, in doing some programming in their careers. Okay. If and this will be the um, the, the one pager, which is funny, they call it one pager when it's actually two pages. But um, this has a background. If you go to tlsk 12org slash volunteers, they have a lot more um, information that's out there. But once they kind of get a pool of volunteers, it's a process where Brian, Jill, and I, and Craig will all be kind of a part of that deal. Um, once it's going on, Microsoft actually comes in twice during the year to observe the volunteer, and we've got some obligation to observe, and then it's it's a pretty polished thing. Um, it's neat because the um, president, right, of Microsoft mm -hmm. is an Appleton West friend. So this, this, yeah, this program basically is in two areas right now, Seattle and and Wisconsin, because of his connection. So it's pretty pretty impressive. Yeah. yeah. So again, um, just one more time, I just want to recognize Craig. A, a lot of 22-year veterans might not want someone to come into their classroom, and Craig embraced it and thought of what an opportunity that is. So um, he's a small, and actually he spent the day on the golf course today. And and that's the lovely weather we had with the, with the varsity guys. <laughs> it came right here, so that's uh, so. Yeah, so excuse my dirty. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I probably didn't want to stand up. And keep yeah. <laughs> so, so any other questions at all?
No. So, or just yeah. kind of have the volunteers come for you? So we will, so well, basically right now, you can start the application process by going to the site. Man, I'm going to work with Mandy to communicate that on our social media platform. Um, and I have a meeting with a Microsoft Teals coordinator in at the end of this month um, as far as what happens next. We're, I, I really don't, I'm assuming they're going to get a pool of people in the area. They say we, de we have some say. I look, actually, we have a pretty uh, tech-involved board that it would shock me if we have something from that area. And, and she said we would have control over who our volunteer is. So, but, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So coming up, Valley View Playground, the Flexible Learning Center. Where's the Yeah. Thank you. So like Jamie mentioned, tonight's just really about giving you some information, uh, letting you know where we spent some of the funds that were graciously donated to us. So, and I just wanted to give you an update on our new Valley View Playground and our innovation learning space um, at, in our LMC. Uh, I think it's important for you guys to realize that none of the uh, funds for either one of these uh, projects came from our district budget. So everything came from through fundraising um, donations. So as far as the playground goes, we had a couple of different companies give us numerous designs so that we could look at some different designs, get some different ideas. We actually had our students then vote on the designs. And as they went through that process, they kind of found some pieces of certain ones that they liked, other pieces of others they liked. So we kind of combined a few different designs. And this is the end result in playground that will be um, installed this summer and the kids are really really excited um, the company we're working with Lee Recreation is a Wisconsin company and they've been just really great as far as working with what our kids are interested in and working with the kind of parameters we have a place for safety and different things so we've been very excited to work with them so we have some thank yous um, first of all we just would like to uh, publicly thank um, the uh, Brenda Harold and Ola Adams Foundation, who very graciously uh, gave Valley View twenty-four thousand uh, dollars towards this project. We also want to thank our Valley View PTO, which gave about forty thousand um, dollars, and a big chunk of that um, from Bethany Friedland, and she was already recognized, but we'll recognize her again. Um, twenty thousand dollars of that forty thousand dollars came directly uh, from one person um, who really uh, stood out with the race craze and did a wonderful work. Um, finally, I think sometimes we take it for granted, and for those who are not been here our, our whole career, um, we really have a unique relationship here in Ashwaubenon with the village, and a big part of this project would not happen if it wasn't for Rex Melberg and the Ashwaubenon Park and Rec. Um, casting our beds and vendors, typically a playground this size would run between twenty five twenty twenty five thousand dollars to install that's just a huge chunk of, of money to to fundraise and to raise rex's team is doing it for free and so i don't think we really realize how fortunate we are so we have the opportunity to personally thank rex and his team um, we would really appreciate that because certainly we wouldn't be able to put this in this summer if it wasn't for the fact that we're getting the installation done for nothing so just um, one other quick thing about our old playground, kind of connected with the race craze and the pay it forward and those types of things that we've been doing. We actually talked to a small organization called Kids Around the World, which actually is a company that will come and take our old playground down and then they do some refurbishing and some fixing or maybe get rid of some parts that don't work anymore. And then the playground equipment is shipped to a third world country where it's put back together. And so that's um, what we're doing with our old playground, which is something pretty exciting and something um, paying it forward and doing the right thing and being heroes um, it's something that we're really excited to talk to our kids about about what's happening with our old playground um, that's going to be happening the week of July 9th this summer that that will be taken down this company will come and take care of that and then Rex and his crew will do some prep work that week and the following week July 16th is when the new playground will be put in so we're very excited about that 
So the second piece that we wanted to talk to you about was the um, innovation learning space. Um, really provides an opportunity for our students to have a space um, in our LMC, flexible learning. So when we talk about flexible learning space, it's furniture that is, is really built so that we can figure out different ways of taking that same pieces of furniture. And uh, we have been working with a vendor who actually originally did the Value View Library. He's still in the business. Um, and uh, just really gave a lot of really good ideas of ways that we could spend that money efi efficiently and then come up with a lot of variety of, um, of ways to do it. So we're uh, very excited about that. Well, I think that was part of the attachments we sent to you as well. Okay. So just a little bit about where those funds came from as well. Um, a large chunk of those funds came from the Ola Adams. Um, donation as well and then seven thousand dollars of that came from the herb Cole foundation if you remember a few years ago um kurt was honored by the school and um, dollars was presented to the school as a result of that so this kind of innovation center area of our library a large portion of that came from those two places and we are just really excited to have that that space has been kind of a little bit of a dormant space in our library for a while because it was an old computer lab and we just have kind of not been quite sure how to repurpose it exactly for like the last couple of years since all of our computer carts all of our computers are carts now and are in the classrooms and we're just really excited to now kind of take the time and figure out the right way to use that space and we're just very excited to have that happening in the next couple of weeks. So I think that's all the yeah, questions? No, I would just say uh, you know volunteers you know, thank you know from all of us and you know all the donators you know that that's a lot of money to donate so we're very appreciative of that very much all right thank you thank you okay great thank you uh moving on to action items uh, talk about the bylaws policy update for the second read right so we have a second read again it's just to abide by requirements I'm just going to open it for questions. We, it does take a motion, obviously, to approve mm -hmm. our second read, so it can become official. Any comments? Any comments? So we need a motion to approve. So I move to approve the. Um, do you need me to number them, or just the bylaws? Just in general, I think it's good. The bylaws policies update. As presented. Okay. As presented. Okay. Yeah, second. A second motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Both nay. Uh, pass. Three zero. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, on to number two, open enrollment in applications. Keith Lucius. Okay. So we've got the numbers in front of you. Um, certain ones we are not recommending approval because we didn't approve open seats. Programs are full. Remind you that just because people apply doesn't mean that they will be here. So I always temper these numbers down, uh, depending on the situation, between 50 and 60 percent likelihood that they actually will be here as open enrollment students. Because that, because they can apply to multiple districts, they can always stay in the resident district. <coughs> they could move. So there's a lot of different things that later on. That's the factor I'm using is about 60 percent of these students will be rely on it. We need to approve them to get the 60 percent. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> and you've gotten the 50, 60 percent because that's what's been historically yeah. past history. Yeah. The one thing I didn't understand is the national uh, or staffing. Um, you know, where it says 2018-19 uh, regular <coughs> education point six. You know, FTE per pupil. Do you remember that offhand? 4K. Oh, that's 4K. Yeah, 4K does not get the full amount. Oh, okay. Because it's not a full day. I'll pull that. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Let's. So, Keith, I'm assuming that we need a motion to approve, right? Yes. Okay. So, entertain a motion. So, I'll move to um, approve the open enrollment in applications. So, we're recommending to approve 245. Right. <laughs> oh, you're gonna fire me. <laughs> 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 um, 
Just say as so Jen I, said. <laughs> I moved to approve the um, open enrollment ad, um, applications, 245 of these applications, and denying 30. Say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Pass uh, three zip. Okay, open enrollment out applications. So Keith. open enrollment out, we don't, I, I, it, it still seems strange to me that you have to approve open enrollment out because you really don't have the authority. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you deny it, yeah, they so can't go? <laughs> do that. That's, they're, there's, they've eliminated the reasons for denial, basically, from the outgoing district. So. We've got uh, 54 applicants, two of them are Duke, and so really 52 applications that we recommend approval. Okay. And it's 49 students because, are there siblings? No, um, people can apply to three places. So if a um, three applies out of here to three different schools, there are so three all applications, applications that's one person. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so. 52 approved. Okay, two did that. So, <laughs> do you want me to do it again? <laughs> I will move to um, approve the out applications, 52 applications, um, and, deny two. and deny two. I second the motion. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Pass uh, 3 0. Okay. Professional staff handbook, Keith and Brian. Okay, so we've got What you'll notice the most is the first one you see, which is the teacher contract. When they break their contract after they've signed it, we have fees. And what we've noticed at that time, we previously approved this, is that our fees were low compared to other districts around. So, one in there is just updating that language to reflect that. Item two is changing some emergency leave language to clarify because we get questions on it, so we're trying to make the language as clear what the intention of emergency leave is and how that works. So, the, and I should mention these are all for teacher contract or teacher handbook. We have a set of administrators and exempt staff. So, this is these are changes just being made to the teacher side. We are going to review the support staff handbook and bring that forward in the future. I can't tell you it will be this summer because we want to have support staff members involved in some of those discussions. So, probably be a fall, winter type thing. And then personal days, we change the language and have simplify the language and we that in that with our administrative team and put this into practice, but we want to update the language in the handbook. So it's really three things that are already being done, we just want to update the language in the handbook. Okay. So entertain a motion. I'll make a motion. Second, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Pass uh, 3 0. Okay. So, Keith, the next one is our second uh, revision of this, our uh, second view of it. So, the, so the, the process for layoff is you have to approve a preliminary layoff in April and then approve the final layoff in May. What they have this year. So, uh, what you'll see are the same three that you approved in April. Two of them are partial layoffs and one is a full layoff. At any time, we can recall them back to their positions or something even more or less, depending on what we have open. So I'm still optimistic. In between now and the time the school year starts, that we would be recalling that person. The partial layoffs, one is voluntary. It's the contract she wants to be at, and the other one, uh, it's one of those things that fluctuates with the number of grade level sections that we have that she is teaching. So uh, okay. that one could increase, could increase.
Okay, budget approval. Keith Lucius. Okay, so at this time of year we do a very high level budget, preliminary budget approval. And basically what you're doing is you're giving us the authority to continue to operate the district once the new year rolls over until we have the end. Typically, this time of year is when we're doing budget cuts. This year, our budget has worked out where we're not cutting. We're in a, in a better financial position. The state budget settled, so we don't have the variables we have in other years. We still have a lot of variables in this, so I want to be clear on that. That student counts obviously are the biggest variable. What happens? But formula that's going to reduce the aid that I currently have in this projection. So I get nervous about putting too much detail out there and raising expectations on things like tax levy because the, I'm not confident in the number that I'm using. It's the number the state's giving me right now. So I, I just want to caution you on that. Some of the factors uh, health and dental increase I have at 5%. That is a big factor. I'm hopeful that we will come in less than 5%. I think 5% is the ceiling right now. Uh, I have an insurance committee meeting next week where I'll know more on where we're coming in. They really tied into the last couple of months. Stop loss coverage for our self-funded plan locked in. But even a 5% increase is better than most districts, probably 90% of districts in the state are seeing. And I'm, I'm hopeful we'll be at a zero increase, which if we do that, that frees up a couple hundred thousand dollars in our budget. Two hundred thousand dollars above that five percent. So, okay. so but that five percent factored in our budget increase for FTEs and teacher staffing in the upcoming budget. And I want to emphasize with that 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 maintains our class sizes. So every time we have teacher FTE changes, people are worried we're raising class size. We're not. We're tied. We tie teacher FTE to number of students we keep in those class size ranges. And while we're not seeing shifting where they are and we can set our class sizes by grade level at the elementary level and target that. So those are factored in, but I, I want to make sure that you and the community know class sizes are not increasing as a matter as a factor as we are. We've stayed with the same class size ranges that we put in place in 2000, I believe it was. So we still have maintained those small class sizes that are still working. Also included, there are and some more compensation things we're going to talk about later. Uh, I increased our open enrollment FTE by 28 students, so that's factoring what you approve for the incoming, factor down that how many, what percentage I'm predicting will show up. As you know, and the board laughs at me about, I'm very conservative, so I, if anything, I would expect to be about 28. I don't want to have a, our budget built on more than that and then have it come in there. So, yeah. so 28 is a conservative number, so hopefully that will improve as we get closer to we get to the start of the school year, we'll see that number. We have an increase in our building cleaning contract, and that is we partner with our building cleaning crew. And we don't just negotiate contracts, we're struggling hiring right now because unemployment is so low, they're having a hard time hiring at their wages they're paying. So we had a meeting with the owners and talked through their problems. And to be honest, we were having some service issues, and we were talking about how do we improve this and, and make sure our buildings are being taken care of. So we negotiated this increase. people in that we feel will be more qualified and do a better job. Um, the remainder I used as a balancing figure was our building budget. The reason I put money into our, our building facilities budget is because we have those safety things we just talked about tonight and I want to have some money to be able to get there. We already committed all of our 2018-19 facility budget with the high school project and this money if we can keep it here would allow us to pull some of those projects in that were planned for 18, 19 that we were delaying. So basically, Michelle asked a question, I share, I forward my response, I'll tell you. Basically, the 18, 19 facilities budget, we pushed off and pushed all 10 years. So what this is doing is putting some money aside so we can look at some of those and pull some forward. Or if there are some safety things that we aren't able to cover, cover with the grant from the state, we could do some of those safety things if we feel there are immediate needs or we can use it for staffing. So it's really a holding place until we know our final budget number. And what we will do then in September, October, we'll plans and maybe have a 
discussion about if we still have this, how do we want to spend it? And, you know, we'll talk about you know, the school services side of it. We'll talk about the building improvements and safety and security side of it and make a decision on if we have this money, how we want to allocate it out. see the need for any additional budget cuts for this year. I want to lay the groundwork for next year. New state budget, elections done. I'm not optimistic that we'll have this this positive budget outlook for the nineteen twenty budget. But we'll see what happens at the state level with the election and we'll see where they come in the state budget is next year. So it's going to be a much more challenging year next year than it's been this year. <coughs> Any uh, discussion? No? Always hope. Yeah, right. It's nice to have a positive. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jay would be right. proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. I assume you need a motion. Yes, to we do need approval. Okay. Entertain a motion? Yeah, I'll move to approve the preliminary budget. A second the motion? First and second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Uh, approved. Three zero. Um, going on to L, uh, Board and Superintendent Communications. Anything else, Mr. Brown? No, I just want to thank Keith for the budget work and uh, all of the ladies that he works with in the office to get, get us there. And I just want to thank Jen also for open enrollment. I've listened for seven years, 12 months a year. million questions she won't say this but she's our go-to person it's a very complicated system can't tell you how many times she'd say no Brian it's this and this and this and that and straightens us <coughs> out and organizes it and I again it just happened that it looks like it's going to happen again every year, every year it continues to go up and we keep saying this is going to plateau or whatever um, no it's not this year is not over we but thank you, Jen, for all those hours and all those phone calls. And Keith, yeah, all thank you. I echo that for Jen because it's not just doing the compliance side, she's making a connection with the family and giving them the information they need. And I think that's a big part of having choice. Their first and initial experience is so positive in dealing with the open enrollment process and having somebody like Jen who can walk them through that process, get them what they need, and treat them well. It makes it a welcoming district in the first experience. And then the principals as well, because they're giving tours and, and taking people around, showing the building. And all Jen's kind of the leader of the team. And I can reiterate that. So, <laughs> open enrollment, I mean, definitely, we originally were looking at another school. And, you know, just because of the welcoming, Chris Fusak did a great job with our kids and coming in, and it was, yeah. Definitely a positive Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Anything from the board? Okay. So moving on to future board meetings topics. Uh, so uh, the scheduled meeting for next time is Wednesday, June thirteenth. Um, we're starting at five p.m. Uh, there's a workshop you know, before the meeting for the board members. Right? And the uh, the next, uh, the board meeting, you know, the official board meeting will start at the same time at 6.30 p.m. that day, June 13th as well. So, any questions on that? Okay. So, we move to adjournment um, to executive session. I don't know why Jay does this, but he asks for a uh, roll call again. Here. 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 Tronson here. And I think... Or motion? Yeah, you do. Um, I move to adjourn to executive session. Second. Second motion. First and second. All favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Okay. We're in executive session. Thank you, everyone. Just Thank for the you, school board members, there's updates on the computer. I know you've had to sit for a long time before and wait at the end of the night. So just to give you a heads up, I don't know if it's oh, going to happen. No, there's our Chromebooks.